In this video, we'll discuss about viruses. Now, whenever we discuss viruses, the first question that comes up is, are viruses living or non-living? Well, uh, this may seem like a very straightforward question, but scientists have been troubled by this question for ages. Finally, scientists have come up with this and they say that viruses are on the border of living and non-living. That actually seems absurd, isn't it? Border of living and non-living. What does that even mean? Well, let's explore that in this video. Now, to begin, let's discuss the basics. Let's say this is a virus. How big do you think a virus is? Well, a virus ranges from 10 nanometers to 100 nanometers. Wait a minute. Uh, how do you know how big a nanometer is? Well, one nanometer is a thousandth of a micrometer. And uh, in millimeters, that's one millionth of a millimeter. And if I write down these figures also in micrometers, that's one hundredth of a micrometer to one tenth of a micrometer. Well, this now is beginning to sound like a mathematics lesson, and it's not that. So uh, let me, you know, make it a little simple. Imagine you take a bacteria. And let's say you cut it up into a hundred small equal pieces. One piece would then be the size of a virus. That's an a simple way to imagine this whole thing. Okay, so uh, a virus is really, really, really tiny, much smaller than bacteria or protozoa and all the other unicellular microorganisms that you've heard of. And it's so small that even those microscopes that we find in our laboratories, normal laboratories, cannot show you the image of a virus. They're so small that microscopes with lenses that use light to see cannot see it. Okay, so what you need to see a virus is something called an electron microscope. Okay, great. Uh, in short, it's really tiny. Okay, so what is the virus actually made up of? Well, it has DNA and RNA information stored inside of it. And that DNA RNA information is stored inside a protective protein covering or a protein sheath. And that's it. That's all that the virus actually has. So the virus does not have a cell per se. Okay, no cell membrane, no cell organelles. The virus is just DNA or RNA with a protein covering. And that's partly why you can't really call it a living organism because it just doesn't have a cell. No mitochondria, no nucleus, none of those things. Okay, great. Now let's move on further and try to see what a virus actually does. How does it behave? Okay, so this is a virus. I've just drawn an asterisk symbol here to denote the virus. And this, let's say, is a human cell. Okay, let me draw a few more of them. We're multicellular, right? Until the virus is outside a living cell, it can do nothing. But the moment the virus enters a living cell, it starts becoming active. When a virus enters a living cell, that living cell is now called the host cell. And the virus is a guest, most probably a very bad guest. But the virus is, virus is like a guest within the host cell. Now, uh, let's write it down what I just said. Outside the living cell, the virus is non-living. But the moment the virus gets within the host cell, it starts acting like a living being in some respects. Okay, And let's see what those respects are, what those things actually are. So let's say the virus is now inside the host cell. What does it do inside the host cell? Well, it starts replicating within the host cell. right? It makes many copies of itself within the host cell. Notice, I've used the word replicate, not reproduce. Why do you think I said that? Well, cells reproduce, but DNA and RNA is copied. Right? So DNA and RNA is just copied, and so the virus actually just makes many copies of itself. Right? Now you might wonder how did the virus manage to make copies of itself? Where did it get that energy from? Well, the virus got the energy from the host cell. It used the host cell's machinery to make copies. And uh, once it did that, it was able to multiply itself. That's why it could not multiply itself outside the host cell because it didn't have any energy, it didn't have the host cell's machinery. Okay, by machinery, I mean cell organelles. Okay, great. Now, what does it do next? We have so many viruses within one host cell. The viruses now destroy the host cell, right? Once they're done away with the host cell, they can now go ahead and attack more cells. And they can now begin the process all over again, begin replicating within the host cell, and then they can destroy the host cell, attack more cells, and this keeps happening. 
What's the final effect of all of this? A large number of cells have been destroyed in the body of this person, right? And that's when they start falling ill. Great. Now let's get back to our original question. Now it kind of begins to make sense to say that viruses are on the border of living and non-living, right? Why? Because outside the host cell they're like non-living, but within the host cell they begin to replicate and that's a little similar to living organisms, right? Okay, let me show you a few pictures of viruses. Here's a picture of the influenza virus, again under a scanning electron microscope. Here's the picture of a rotavirus. The rotavirus is a virus that causes diarrhea, especially in children. Then we've got the coronavirus. The coronavirus is the virus that caused the pandemic in the years 2020 to 2022. If you don't know about it, go and Google it. It's a pretty interesting story. Sad one at that, but Humanity learned a lot of lessons during that time. Okay, uh, now we've talked about a lot of viruses that are disease causing, right? Now let's come to a virus that is kind of useful and good. This one's called the bacteriophage. This is how it looks like, this is what it looks like. And uh, this virus actually attacks bacteria. So in a way it's very good for a lot of animals because bacteria that's within the animal can be attacked by the bacteriophage and it can destroy the bacteria. So here's, here's the bacteria, here's the bacteriophage. The bacteriophage enters the bacteria, multiplies, destroys the bacteria. But the interesting part, it often does not attack any animal cells. So it's a way of killing bacteria within, say, an animal or a human without attacking the human or the animal itself. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching.